Hello, and welcome to another monthly focus on a feature online tutorial using the integrated genome browser. My name is Dr. Nolan Fries, and I will once again be your host for today. Now, in the past couple of months, we've covered analysis and visualization of some of the major whole genome next gen sequencing experiments, so things like RNA-seq and ChIP-seq. Uh, today, I'd like to cover another seq method, whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So bisulfite sequencing allows us to view methylation through the process of bisulfite conversion. So what this is is if we have our genomic fragment, we've got a cytosine here that's methylated, and we've got our two cytosines here that are unmethylated. When we treat it with sodium bisulfite, what happens is that these unmethylated cytosines become thymines, whereas our methylated cytosine is protected from that conversion and stays as cytosine. So for whole genome bisulfite sequencing, what we can do is we can fragment the entire genome, right? So we'll have lots of these fragments, do that bisulfite conversion, and then once we've sequenced those, we can then take the reads and compare them to the genomic or reference sequence. Now what it'll see here is that the methylated cytosines are still cytosines, and so it'll know that these are, are methylated. Uh, whereas here we've got our thymines and it should be a cytosine in the reference we know that these are then non-methylated. So there are a number of programs out there to carry out whole genome bisulfite sequencing analysis and I chose to go with Bismarck. Now Bismarck is a freely available command line tool. It's made by Abraham Bioinformatics and this is the same group that makes FastQC and a number of other bioinformatics programs. Now, Bismarck works by taking your genomic fragment, and then this is it after bisulfite sequence conversion, uh, and then converting that computationally to a two different versions. And these two different versions are where we take uh, all of the cytosines in it and convert them to thymines, and all of the guanines to adenines. And what it's going to then do is it's going to take these two, and it's going to align them to two different genomes, and these two different genomes are our reference genomes, but they've been converted to bisulfite genomes. One of our genomes will be cytosine to thymine, and then we'll have another version that will be all guanines to adenines. And then Bismarck is going to take each of these reads that have been computationally converted and align them to these two different genomes and say which of these four options uh, is the unique best alignment. So unlike in some of the previous focus on the futures, I'm not actually going to be running Bismarck through Galaxy today. So it, it is currently available as a tool on the Galaxy Toolshed, but it's an unverified to tool, so it's not yet available through the normal Galaxy interface. So if you do want to run Bismarck, at the moment you'll most likely need to run it through the command line. Now the documentation for Bismarck is very good and it's very easy to follow. And so I've already run some example data uh, from the sequence read archive through Bismarck. And I just want to briefly go through some of the steps involved so that you kind of know the general approach and you'll have an idea of the output. And that output's what we're really interested in, and especially the, the output that we can take and then visualize in IGBY. So there are four steps to this. And the first step is going to be to prepare our bisulfite converted genomes. So our input is our reference genome, and then our output is going to be uh, these two converted genomes, so all the C's to T's in one and all the G's to A's in another. And once you've done this, it's, it's done. You don't have to redo it for this genome. Then that second step will be to take your reads, so here I've got my, my dataset.fastq, and to align it to uh, these two reference genomes. And so the output from that will be a BAM file. So this is going to be our aligned reads as well as a report.txt file. And this file looks like this. And what it is is just some information as to how did I run Bismarck, what did I do, what were my inputs, um, but then also things like our mapping efficiency. So Bismarck uses both tie to align. Um, and so in this case, we can see I've got a 66.3% mapping efficiency. It's relatively good. Um, but we're also going to get our uh, numbers of methylation. So in this case, I've got number of Cs methylated in my CPG context is 23.6%. So that's kind of the general, uh, what is my CPG methylation? How about my CHG, 7.6%, uh, and my CHH is 2.9%. The third step will be to then take 
the information that's in those aligned reads now and to actually pull out the methylation data. So the input will be our BAM, or in this case SAM file, and the output will be six individual text files, so .txt files. And what each one is, is uh, one for the CPG, one for the CHG, and one for the CHH. And then you're gonna have these outputs for both the top strand and the bottom strand. Now these files themselves, these text files, are kind of in a proprietary format, and so we can't actually view them directly in AB, but what you can do is do this fourth step in this Bismarck to bed graph. And what this is going to do is it's gonna take these .txt files, and for each one it's gonna turn it into a bed graph file. And that's really what we're gonna be interested in since this is gonna be uh, what we can view directly in AB. And then lastly, I just wanted to point out, if you're gonna be running this, um, on a personal computer, so if you're, if you're running it on a cluster, you know, it should be fine. I'm sure you'll have, have plenty of, of resources, but if you're running it on a personal computer, uh, so in my case I ran it on just my Mac, then you want to make sure you've got enough RAM and powered. Bismarck will run up to four instances of Bowtie simultaneously, and what Bowtie is going to do is it's going to load that reference genome into memory. And so if you're trying to do four of those at the same time and you're uh, let's say you're doing human data, well the human data is going to have a genome that's about 3 GB, that means you're going to need at least 12 GB just to run uh, Bismarck by itself. And then similarly, you're going to need about one core per instance of Bismarck to run that, so you probably need five cores at least to start with. And then lastly, I thought I'd point out that for hard drive space, you'll need a, a decent amount of hard drive space, and the, the reason I point this out is because the FASTQ files you're going to get from this are going to be quite large. Um, you're, you're effectively resequencing the entire genome, and you're probably doing it at a pretty good depth, you know, 10 to 20x at least. And so if you're, if you're doing that across the whole genome, so for an Arabidopsis files, for which we'll be working with today, this Arabidopsis genome is 22 times smaller than a human genome, and the FASTQ file that I had from it was over 50 GB. You know, these are these are large, large files. So you want to have at least double the size of your input FASTQ file of free space, because each of the outputs that you're going to get, like those six .txt files, uh, those are going to be pretty sizable. Plus, your your BAM or SAM file um, will also be quite large. All right. So today's example comes from the cell paper that was looking at methylation in Arabidopsis, and these authors were interested in the effect of knocking out a gene on methylation. So we've got a wild type and a, a knockout to kind of compare. And I've included all of the data I'm going to use in a public instance of Galaxy. Also make sure that you're running Igby in the background. So Igby you can get at biovis.org, the downloads. And if you've never used Galaxy before, it's, it's, a, it's a great system. Um, uh, over here on the left you've got all of the tools that are accessible to you in terms of, of running uh, different types of bioinformatics. In the center you've got what is kind of our, our main page where results and whatnot will show up. And then over here on the right we have our history. And for today I'm really interested in this history uh, since this is, is what we'll be working with. So the first thing I thought we could do is look at our FASTQC file. So anytime you are about to embark on analysis, you probably want to start off with FASTQC. Just make sure that the reads you got back from the sequencing center look good and are what you expect. And I thought it would be kind of interesting because our by sulfite converted reads are going to look a little bit different. So if I click on this I to open up our, our FASTQC and you go to this per base sequence content, what you can see here is it's you know it's been marked with a red X, you know, something's wrong here according to FASTQC. But in reality all it is is that our thymines are uh, increased and our cytosines are, are decreased, so you know pretty low, so two or three percent. But this is what we expect because all of these cytosines have been converted, or the vast majority of cytosines have been converted to thymines. As we saw, there's only a relatively smaller percentage of reads that were methylated, and so those are the only ones that are actually gonna show up as cytosines when it's sequenced. So while this might look like an error, um, we know that it's not. Okay, so now that we know our reads are good, the first two steps in Bismarck would be to create our bisulfite converted genome and then to align our reads to that. And the output from this is gonna be that BAM file I was talking about. So if you click on the bsseq uh, chr1 wild type, see that I've got a BAM file uh, ready to go. So go ahead and click on display and click on the view. 
And as long as you've got Igby installed and up and running, it's just going to automatically load into the correct genome. Uh, we're going to correct this certificate. Yes. And yes, we we'll want to load our data. And I can go ahead and kind of simplify this view a little bit. I'm just going to click on the Terra 10 mRNA, and then down here in this data management, I'm going to put the positive and minus strand just into one track. And this file is relatively large, a spam file. We can see it up here. So it hasn't loaded yet. It's grayed out. But we don't want to load all 2 GB over the internet from, from Galaxy. So what we're going to want to do is zoom in on a gene or a region of interest to look at some of these reads. But if you're new to Igby, just to kind of orient you very quickly, so this is our, our main screen. Over here you can choose your chromosomes. A lot of the tools we'll be using are down here, and then these are your different tracks. So whenever you load in new data, it's going to appear over here. Now, in order to zoom in, we can use this horizontal zoom slider. Zoom in. Also, if there's a region of the genome that we're interested in, uh, you can just highlight it along this coordinates axis. And then if there's a feature, so in this case a genome, or a gene annotation that you're interested in, just go ahead and double click on it. I'll just double click on the name here. And it'll just kind of zoom in on, on that. So, and I've already have a region that I'd like to look at. So it's up here. So I've got one gene here, and I'm going to right click over here on this tier 10, and I'm going to hit Optimize Stack Height, and then I'm going to go ahead and load our data. Okay, so we've got lots of reads. It's only going to show us the first 10. Uh, so similar to what I just did, if I right click on this BSSeq and I click on Optimize Stack Height, it's going to show us all of our reads. So okay, we can see that we've got lots of reads, and uh, you know, unlike RNA seq or chip seq or something like that, they're going to be you know across the entire genome. Um, they shouldn't be localized to any one place. Okay, we've got good coverage. That's great. Uh, but what about our methylation? So we can go ahead and click on one of these, and then you can click on the selection info up here. And this is going to give you all the information about that read, so it's residues and scores for those. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, it's going to show us this. Now what this is saying is that each nucleotide is a dot, and then each cytosine um, is either an H, Z, or an X, depending on if it's a C CPG, a CHG, or a CHH. And if it's lowercase, it is unmethylated. And if it's uppercase, it's methylated. And oddly enough, all of these are methylated. So we actually have quite a bit of methylation going on in this location. And that's, that's you know, great. But obviously, we're not going to sit here and trawl through all of our reads. That's just, that, that would just be silly. So what you really need to do is, once you've got your BAM file, you know, you can check it, make sure that, uh, you know, your reads look good and you've got good coverage across it. But then what you're running, going to want to do is run those last two steps in Bismarck. So running that methylation extractor and then convert that output uh, text files into bed graph files. So I've already done this and they are in Galaxy. We've got two of these bed graph files. Now remember you're going to have six come out for each one. So in theory I would have six for my wild type and six for my knockout. And those six are going to be the, the CPG, the CHG, and the CHH. Uh, and that's just the three different instances that we usually see methylation in uh, cytosines. And the, the H just stands, it can be an adenine, a cytosine, or a thymine. And you're going to have that original top, the OT, so the top strand or positive strand, and then the OB, uh, original bottom strand. Now these files, if we take a look at them, are really simple. There's not too much to them. It's just the chromosome, the start and the stop, and that's just going to be a single base pair because we're just looking at a cytosine and then a value between 0 and 100. And what that value equates to is a percent. So what Bismarck has done is it's gone through all of your reads at that location and said uh, all of the reads, in this case, 100% of them are methylated at that position. And you know, in this one, it's going to be 60% and, and so on. And you might be wondering, OK, why is this a percentage? Uh, why is it not just binary? You know, how, how can something be a, be a percentage methylated? Shouldn't it just be it's methylated or not? Well, what it comes down to is, is a couple things. They're kind of interesting. 
So for this study, they took a whole Arabidopsis plant and ground it up. So you've got all kinds of different cells, all kinds of different tissues in there, and they're going to have different levels of methylation between them often. And so you're going to get kind of a, a smattering of what was the overall methylation within all of those tissues. Uh, you can also run into instances where, you know, you're looking at a diploid organism that you might have heterozygosity. So, you know, on, on one copy of the chromosome, it's, it's methylated, and on another copy, it's not. You know, it, it could be due to uh, parental inheritance. And then finally, you can also just have incomplete bisulfite conversion. So, you know, during the wet lab process, when you're doing this bisulfite conversion, you know, maybe just not 100% of the reads uh, were converted. So, you know, those are uh, good reasons for, for why that can happen. Um, but ultimately, we need to be able to say, well, is it methylated or not? You know, is this 23%, do we consider that methylated or unmethylated? And kind of trawling through the internet and, and talking to a few people, the general consensus seems to be that somewhere around 30% to 0%, so between 0 and 30, you generally consider it to be unmethylated. And then anywhere from 70 to 100%, you say it's methylated. And this might be, you know, you might have to change those values. If you're working with like a, you know, single clonal cell line, um, you know, you might really expect them to be either 0 or 100. You know, you might expect it to be very binary. Um, but for, you know, whole organisms or, or mixtures of cells and tissues, you know, you'll have to come up with, with this cutoff, uh, whatever fits for your data. And we can kind of get a feel for how this looks if we go over to this histogram and we click on this view data. So what I've done here is, is included a histogram of our data. I think this is for the CHCOT in the wild type, um, showing us where our, our percents of methylation kind of fall between all of them. And you can see that the majority of our data points fall right at 0%. And then there's this kind of trailing down peak from that but pretty much all of them fall between that 0 and 30 that we've, we've defined. And then there's you know, a little peak here, a little peak at 50%, so you know, maybe that could be that heterozygosity thing I was talking about. And then we've got, starting at 70, this little bit of a bubble, and then this peak at 100%. So between 30 and 70, you know, there's really not a lot of information there. Uh, this really encapsulates doing the 0 to 30 and 70 to 100, the majority of our data. So let's go ahead and take a look at our bed graph files. So I'm going to click on the wild type and I'm going to click on display in Igby. And we should just be able to jump right to Igby. Okay, and I want to change, I'm going to, I'm going to click on this track, the, our BAM file track, and I'm going to change it to don't load. And then I'm going to collapse it down just to give us some more space here. And I'm going to back all the way out. And then go ahead and click on load data. So these bed graph files are much, much smaller. They're only about 20 megabytes uh, for this, this one chromosome. So with a pretty fast internet connection, you should be able to load this data uh, for the entire chromosome very quickly. So what you can see is a graph of all of our data. And what it's doing is kind of drawing a, a average through this of where our data points are. And so you can get a feel for, you know, where are their peaks in methylation within our data. And there's this big peak kind of right here at the centromere. Uh, it's pretty standard. And then we've got a few other peaks. There's a big peak right there. And there looks like there's one here. So let's say that that's, that's part of our experiment. That's what we're interested in. We want to know, you know, something more about what's going on here. So if you click on there and then zoom in, Let's, let's see what's going on here. It looks like it's probably right here is where that was looking. And it looks like it's all within this one gene. Okay, so this is interesting. We've got lots of methylation here. Uh, why don't we go ahead and change our BAMP file back to manual. And I'm gonna load that, those reads in. Let's see, actually I'm gonna drag this down. Oh. I'll drag that up. And I'm going to load the sequence as well for this region. So you'll see that sequence loaded down here at the bottom. And then go ahead and uncollapse this. And then I'm actually going to split it too into positive and negative strand. Okay, so now we got our 
methylation down here at the bottom, and then we've got our positive and minus reads. And we can actually just grab this slider over here to the left and kind of drag this out. Uh, and I also, I'm going to zoom in on this region. Let's see here. I think maybe just this. Okay. Now we stretch that out a little bit and give us some breathing room. Okay, so what we can see here, and what's kind of interesting is that Igby is taking our BAM files and it's saying, uh, what points in this read, or in every read, uh, do and do not line up with the reference sequence. So where it does line up with the reference sequence, it's just colored blue, and where it's not lining up with the reference sequence, it's actually providing us with uh, so a change in color, and it's telling us what that base pair is. And so you can see that in our positive strand, all of our cytosines have been converted to thymines, or at least a vast majority of them. And then in the negative strand, so it's the opposite, it's all of the guanines have been converted into adenines. Now if we look at where Bismarck has predicted there to be methylation, so right here, so I think this is somewhere around 80% methylation rate. If we look at our reads, we can see that, yep, the majority of the reads are still cytosines. So you remember that the, the methylation protects the cytosines from being converted to thymines. And so we've only got a, a few in here that were converted to the thymines. So the same over here, this is kind of a lesser percentage. You can see there's fewer reads that are still cytosines. And then also keep in mind that this is only for this top strand. So we, we're, we're not saying anything for the bottom strand. And this is important if you're interested in looking at methylation within a gene, for instance, or, or whatnot, and you want to, you know, your genes on the negative strand, then you want to know the strandedness of your methylation. So that's why it's important to have those, those two different versions, the, the top strand and the bottom strand, so you can actually see where that methylation is occurring. Why don't we get rid of the BAM file for now? So actually, I can just come down here and click on this red X. Yes, I want to get rid of it. And then I'm going to back all the way out again. Not bad. I'm going to stay here. So now let's say we've got a pretty good idea. There's a lot of methylation here, but we're only going to consider something methylated if it's over that 70%, right? So we want to be able to kind of threshold our data and say which of these points are, are actually meet our criteria. So if you click on your track here, and remember this is a graph, come down here and click on graph and click on the thresholding. Now this thresholding, we're going to turn on, and we're set to greater than, that's what we want, and we want a value of 70, and that's going to equate to 70%, uh, as the values fall from 0 to 100. And then this max gap, I'm going to put it 10, so this just means that if you've got two methylation points, and uh, they're both over 70, and they're within 10 base pairs of each other, it's just going to draw it as one solid rectangle. And then this min run, I'm going to turn to 1, because I want to be able to see each instance of methylation. So now we have this, this thresholding here. And you know, it's a little helpful. We can see, okay, this, this, a lot of these points really are uh, methylated via our criteria. But then a lot of these kind of intronic uh, methylation points are, are not methylated or do not meet our criteria, as well as this group right here. Now, how about if we wanted to compare this? So, you know, in our study, we want to compare our wild type to our knockout. So go ahead and go back to Galaxy and click on our bed graph uh, knockout and click on View. And we'll go back to Igby and go ahead and load in that data. Okay, so now we've got our knockout and it looks pretty similar. There's also a, a lot of methylation within this region. So let's go ahead and threshold it and see how those compare. So I'm going to visibility, click on, change it to 70, 10, and 1. So now we can see that in our knockout we've got a few more methylation points within like this instant or this region for instance. Uh, as well as over here. So it's helpful, now we can see some, start to see some of the differences between them, but really what we want now is to just be able to see the actual differences between them. Which methylation points are in the knockout that aren't in the wild type and vice versa. And so in order to do that, what we can do is, I'm just gonna select the wild type one first, go back to thresholding, and we're gonna click on make track. 
So this is going to make uh, a new track, and that track is just going to have the data points for our threshold, so everything over 70% uh, for the wild type in this case. And I'm going to do the same thing for our knockout. Make track. And now I can just go ahead and hide these two. We're not going to really need to be able to see them anymore. So that data will still be there. We don't need to see it. And then under data access, these names are really confusing, so I'm just going to change this. This is knockout thresh and wild type thresh. So now we can take these two tracks and we can start to compare them to each other. And in order to do that, what you're going to do is go down to annotation. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my knockout first. And then I'm going to shift click and select the wild type. And I'm going to come down here uh, to operations. And under multi-track, I want to select A, not B. So this is going to say what is in knockout and it's not in my wild type. And then I'm going to click go. And then I want to do the same thing for my B not A, so this is going to be what's in wild type and not in knockout. And then we can go ahead and hide these two again. And under data access, I'm, I'm going to change the names one more time. So this is knockout only and wild type only. So now we can see that in our knockout, we've got a lot more methylation points within this region compared to our wild type. So this is kind of what we had, had started to see uh, a little earlier, but now we can really tell that there's a, a pretty big difference between the knockout and wild type. And since these files are relatively small, and I'm not, I won't demonstrate this right now, but since these files are relatively small, you could view this throughout the entire genome, and that would really let you see you know, which regions of my genome have a lot more methylation within the knockout versus wild type, or vice versa, you know, depending on your, your experimental conditions. Now, since methylation is often involved with changes in gene expression, I thought it would be kind of fun to take a look at how this methylation might be affecting gene expression within this region. So if you also just happen to do RNA-seq, for instance, uh, then we can overlay those results as well. So in this experiment, we do have RNA-seq data, and I've included both for the wild type and the knockout here in Galaxy. So go ahead and click on these, and go ahead and load them into Igby. Okay, so we see our two new files. I'm going to go ahead and just load that data in, get just a brief glimpse of what that looks like. So instead of trying to look at our reads directly, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and make depth graphs from these. And so those depth graphs are just going to show what are the number of reads across this region from this file. So if you click on that track, or on your, your RNA-C track, and go to annotation, and under these operations single track, we can do depth graph, and hit go. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my knockout, depth graph, go. And then I can go ahead and hide both of these. Okay, so now for these depth graphs, you're going to want to select both of them. So I shift click to select both of them. And then these are graphs now, so go to graph and put them on the same y-axis. Just grab the, the y-axis slider and, and move it with both of them selected and put them both on the same, same axis. And you can start to see that, okay, there's seems like there's a little bit of a difference here and here, maybe here and here. And so a lot like what we did with the methylation work, you know, maybe we just want to see, you know, what is the difference uh, between these. And so what we can do is I'm going to select my knockout first and then my wild type. And down here under operations, multigraph, I can do the difference between these. So I'm just going to hit go. And I'll hide these. I'm actually going to change the color of this. So now what you can see is that our increase in methylation within the gene uh, does seem to correlate with somewhat of an increase in expression of that gene in the knockout. Now in this case we've got a, a decrease in expression maybe within these two exons. You know, and that might indicate some form of alternative splicing or something that's going on here. And as always with Igby, um, you know, we're all about making publication quality images. So if we wanted to make an image from this, 
Um, I'm actually going to go ahead, if you click on view up here and do hide visual tools, it'll get rid of that, that zoom stripe, so you're not going to see that anymore. Uh, and then click on the camera icon and name it whatever you want. And I want to just have just this main view here. And then go ahead and click on OK. And you'll get an image that looks like this. So pretty much just what you're looking at at a high resolution. You know, and you can you can change the colors and move things around all you want. So this is really a great way to very quickly and easily you know look for differences in your data between methylated and methylation in your data. You know, between a, a control and a treatment, and to potentially overlay your other results. Maybe you've got ChIP-seq data or RNA seq, whatever it is, and and to compare those and look between them. So I hope you found this helpful. The the data sets we've been looking at today. Uh, will stay in Galaxy as, as publicly available, so you can go through them, um, explore them. Uh, you can download them as well, just to look at, at how the data is set up. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. So thank you for joining the IGB team, and we hope to see you again next month for another Focus on a Feature.